it's fantastic to see so many people here interested in the water quality of Windermere. So what I'm going to try and do is spend about 20 minutes or so trying to tell you something about the big Windermere survey. Okay? Uh, I'm going to talk about the project this evening, but the project has been fundamentally reliant on many, many other organisations and colleagues. So particularly the Freshwater Biological Association, who have been fundamental to the survey, but also colleagues from UKCEH and from the Environment Agency that we've heard about or heard from earlier today. So I'm going to try and keep you awake and interested in three issues for the next 20 minutes. I'm going to tell you something about what this thing, the Big Windermere Survey, is. Some of you have been involved in it, others of you may have heard about it but have not been involved in it. So how is it designed? What were we trying to do to address some of the questions that we heard earlier today? I'll then spend some time talking about some key results from the first 12 months and I'll talk about two areas. I'll first tell you something about nutrients, particularly about phosphorus that we've heard about, and then secondly I'll tell you something about bacteria from the Big Windermere survey. And if I haven't lost too many of you by that stage, I'll say something about the latest data that came from the Big Windermere survey that was completed in August this year, and the results of which we released earlier in November. So, what is the Big Windermere survey? So first and foremost, it is a citizen or it's a community science approach to examining water quality in Windermere. So we're focused on the lake itself, but also importantly, water quality in the catchment that drains into Windermere. So the aim here is to complement, to extend the type of monitoring work that Steve and Ellie talked about for four basins within the catchment the 28 sites that Dave described for the Environment Agency to really try and generate some spatially intensive snapshots of water quality in the catchment. And I'll show you what I mean by spatially intensive in a slide or two's time. So we had two main aims when we set up the survey. The first one was to engage the community in gathering these spatially intensive snapshots of water quality. And then the second aim was to use the data, the evidence that comes from the survey as part of conversations with others in the catchment to see action to improve water quality. Okay, so those were the, the two aims when we designed the project. Over the last 12 to 18 months that we've been working on the survey, it's grown. And we would argue it's now actually the largest, most significant example of this type of community science approach being applied to water quality in the UK. Where did it come from? Initially, myself at Lancaster University and colleagues at the FBA designed it in the early part of 2022. The first survey, some of you may have taken part in that in June last year, was funded by Lancaster University. And subsequent uh, surveys have received funding from a number of different organisations that you can see on the slide here. And this funding is used to purchase the equipment that you collect samples with if you've volunteered for the survey, and also to pay for things such as the sample analysis. So, originally when we designed the survey, we identified over 100 locations in the catchment. It's a little bit difficult to pick up here, but right in the north, we're on the Rothe upstream of Grasmere, and we're coming all the way down to the Leven downstream of Windermere. So this is what we mean by a spatially intensive snapshot of water quality around the catchment. So 100 to 109 sample sites that we will, we will try and go out and capture data from. So contrast that with the number of sites spatially that we heard about from Steve and Ellie and from, D, from Dave at the EA. This is one of the differences with the Big Windermere survey. So how do we identify these sites? Why did we go to some locations and not others? Two reasons. Could we legally access the sites and could we safely access the sites? When I say we, I mean the royal we, by which I mean our volunteers. And then secondly, do we have sites that are streams, that are lakes that are of interest, that are rivers that are of interest in the catchment? And for the lakes, we have this really strong focus on the shoreline. So you've heard about some of the really great long-term monitoring from UKCEH, but that's primarily focused on as Ellie and Steve said, the deeper water, the pelagic area of lakes. It's not so heavily focused on that shoreline area where users of those lakes will first interact with the water and actually scientifically where there's a big gap 
in our understanding of how these lakes behave? How are they influenced by inflows into the lakes and streams and rivers? So it, it's not a simple logistical exercise to deliver one of these surveys. So we build sample kits. You can see Emma and Trini at the FBA hard at work here producing the sample kits for our volunteers. We also produce a training video to support our volunteers. And both the training video and the sample kits are based on exactly the same research approaches that I would use in my day-to-day -day research job at Lancaster. Our volunteers then sign up to collect samples during one of the big Windermere survey dates, and they will all go out in a two-hour window and try and collect samples from those hundred-odd sites around the catchment. Absolutely impossible as a scientist for me to imagine getting a hundred samples from a catchment the size of Windermere's in one two-hour window without the community science approach. This is really novel and very, very new data. You'll return as a volunteer, you'll sample to one of our sample hubs. So here's my colleague Steve, who you heard from earlier, hard at work, gloves on, good Steve, glasses on, excellent. So measuring pH and conductivity in the samples. And then in terms of further analysis, we'll take those samples and they'll be analysed for a whole range of water quality parameters in research laboratories at Lancaster. For the bacterial data I'll tell you about, we send those to external accredited laboratories that can deal with 100 samples at one time. So we've undertaken five big Windermere surveys so far, starting in June last year and running seasonally through to August this year. And I just wanted to say that this has been a huge effort from our volunteers. So over 300 volunteers, over a thousand hours of volunteer time, collecting 600 litres of water from the catchment. We won't talk about drought conditions just at the moment. Maybe we should return some of that. And leading to over two and a half thousand sample analyses. So thank you very much to the volunteers who have taken part so far. So let me turn to the second issue I was going to talk to you about. Let me tell you something about the key results from the first 12 months of the survey. But uh, before I do that, just a, a comment or two for context. So the Big Windermere survey is a seasonal survey. We are going out to monitor, to try and characterise changes in water quality at seasonal scale, approximately every three months. Hopefully you can see that uh, in these data. So these are all of the water temperature data we collected. In the top panel for all of the lake sites, in the bottom, bottom panel even for all of the river sites. And we're looking at summer last year, autumn, winter through to spring 23. And hopefully you can see this unsurprising seasonal pattern. Water temperatures higher in the summer, lower in the winter. The range is about 12 degrees C. Slightly larger for the lakes and the rivers because a number of our lakes warm up more in the summer than they do for our rivers. So the Big Windermere Survey is well designed to capture these type of seasonal surveys. Sorry, seasonal changes. I'm not saying to you that short term, more rapid changes in water quality aren't important. They absolutely are. For example, what's going on during a rainfall and runoff event? That's absolutely an important characteristic of the catchment. But that is not what the Big Windermere survey, mobilising 100 or so volunteers once a season, is able to capture. If we want information about that, we need other approaches, such as the SOMs that Dave talked about, or the in-situ monitoring that Ellie and Steve mentioned uh, on the lakes in the catchment. Okay, so I'm going to tell you something now about, about the, the story around nutrients. Now, I'm a water quality scientist. I spend most of my professional time working on nutrients, particularly on phosphorus. I think it's fair to say phosphorus has had a pretty bad press as a nutrient recently, okay? I just wanted to say to us all that phosphorus is also an absolutely essential element for all life on Earth. So for us as humans, if we want to build strong bones, if we want good enamel, I'm sure all of us are now closing our lips, trying not to think about whether our teeth look like this glossy image, but good enamel. If you want to build a coding system in your cells, which are strands of DNA, in each case, your body will need phosphorus. There is no replacement for these purposes. So it is essential to all life. 
And the same is true for the aquatic organisms that we see in rivers and lakes and streams. So I'm showing you three images of some of the types of cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae, that we might find in lakes like Windermere. And these organisms will need phosphorus to build their structure, to build their cell walls. However, there's a but coming. As with most things in life, too much of a good thing can cause us problems. As we add more phosphorus to fresh waters, you can increase the rate at which these organisms grow, the amount of biomass that they can accumulate. You might even change the type of organism that dominates in a community. And if you push things too far, you can have some undesirable consequences. Most obviously, blooms of cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. Now, phosphorus is one factor that's been implicated in these blooms. But as a scientist, and as Ellie and Steve will tell you, there are other factors we need to consider, including in lakes like Windermere, the temperature of the system. Where are other nutrients that these cyanobacteria need, such as nitrogen? Where are they coming from? Okay. But it's true to say that phosphorus has been implicated in these blooms. Some of you, many of you, will have Windermere and blooms in, in Windermere in your minds when you're thinking about this. Here on the left, I'm going to take you to North America, though. I'm going to take you to Lake Erie. The border between the US and Canada runs through the middle of Lake Erie. Here's the city of Detroit. In this satellite image, this vivid green colour is a sign of bacterial bloom on Lake Erie. They occur very, very regularly, very intensely in this system. Many of the communities living around the lake require the lake water for public water supply. And when you have a big sign of bacterial bloom, a toxin-producing bloom within the lake, that can disrupt public water supply to the extent that you have these cartoons of toxic algal terror coming from the lake. This is a city of Toledo in 2014. These blooms don't just occur in fresh waters. Here I'm going to take you to a marine environment. This is the Baltic Sea. I'm going to show you the east coast of Sweden, the island of Gotland here. And these rather beautiful green swirls are cyanobacteria, but this time in the marine environment. So these blooms occur widely in fresh waters and marine environments. But I said that phosphorus is one of the factors that triggers potentially these blooms. So we are measuring total phosphorus concentrations and other forms of phosphorus that Ellie told you something about earlier today in our big Windermere survey samples. So I'm now going to show you some data from the first 12 months. Here we've got total phosphorus from low concentrations on the bottom to high concentrations on the top. And I'm going to show you four panels for each season from summer last year through to spring this year. And each of those panels will show you the north and south basins of Windermere. Okay? Uh, for those of you who dropped or wish to drop GCSE or O-level mathematics, I won't ask you about the box and whisker diagrams. I'll just say the individual black dots are individual sample concentrations. The orange or yellow diamond is the average concentration, probably for us to focus on today. So you can see in summer, we actually had slightly higher average concentrations of total phosphorus in the north compared to the south basin. When we moved into autumn, those concentrations increased slightly for both basins. And when we looked at actually some individual samples our volunteers collected in the autumn, we saw some really quite high concentrations in the autumn. In winter, those average concentrations got down and they became more consistent. There was less spread in the data. And a similar pattern then in spring. So we have this seasonal change in total phosphorus, higher in summer and autumn, lower in winter and spring. And that might be due to a number of causes. It might be because there's more input phosphorus to the lake in summer and autumn. For example, with higher visitor numbers, an important time of year for the catchment. It might also be because these are times of year when algae are growing and fixing phosphorus within their cells that we then capture during the Big Windermere survey. Okay, so a question I'm often asked is, okay, but how good or bad are the phosphorus concentrations in Windermere? And we can use some standards from the Water Framework Directive. So Dave mentioned this piece of European legislation with standards now within UK law. And those standards allow us to group sites between high in blue, good in green, moderate in yellow, poor in orange, and bad in red status. Okay? The default target for waters in the UK is for sites to be at good or high status, so to be in the green or the blue bars. 
a big health warning here, thanks to a colleague of Dave's from the Environment Agency for banging me over the head with this health warning. The classifications that are reported by organisations like the Environment Agency will not show you seasonal data. They will gather those seasonal data together over multiple years and create an average for classification. So I'm not doing that, so I'm not reporting official classifications. I'm using these standards to give us a sense of how phosphorus concentrations have changed through the year. So we can see that in each season, on the top are all the sites on the North Basin, on the bottom the sites on the South Basin. In each season for North and South Basin, we are somewhere away from all of our sites being in blue or in green, so in high organ status. Actually, the best season for us here was in summer, when about 60% of Windermere shoreline sites were at high orbit status. In winter, we had about 10% of those sites at high orbit status. So there's clear evidence in our big Windermere survey data that we would need to do more to reduce the phosphorus concentrations in the lake to the point at which we're able to restore and protect this ecosystem, as I'm sure many of us would like to see. However, how does phosphorus concentrations in Windermere compare to other lakes and tarns in the catchment? So we can use Big Windermere survey data to answer that question. Here you're looking at phosphorus concentration again, <laughs> but now for the south and north basin of Windermere, but also Rydal, Grasmere, Gilhead Reservoir, Esway Water and Blellum Tarn. And this is the full year of data. Again, the yellow diamond is the average. And the red dotted line here I've just put in for the Windermere South Basin to give you some context. So hopefully we can see that for some standing waters, so Rhinor, Grasmere and Gilhead Reservoir, their average concentrations are lower than we see in either of the Windermere basins. But Blenheim and Tarn in our samples came out pretty much the same as Windermere South Basin. And indeed Estwick Water had slightly higher average total phosphorus concentrations. So the message I wanted to communicate here is Windermere is not alone in respect of facing pressures around phosphorus. That's not to downplay the importance of Windermere, but it's to say that there are other standing waters in the catchment, nationally and globally, that face similar challenges. And we can learn from what is done in those systems to help us in the terms of the future of Windermere. Okay, it's a nice subject for discussion just before I try and wrap up soon. That's about the bacteria in samples from the Big Windermere survey. So we measured different groups of bacteria. On the right hand side are cells of E. coli that some of you will have heard of. On the left hand side are cells of Enterococci, and they're really small. They're a millionth of a metre in length scale, a thousandth of a millimetre. So these two groups of bacteria are what are called faecal indicator organisms, or FIOs. And for us, FIOs are bacteria. If we see these at high concentrations, it indicates that there may be faecal material within a sample. Faecal material is the material that's come from your or my digestive system, but also importantly from the digestive system of animals and potentially of birds. Why are we concerned about faecal material? Because that might also suggest that human pathogens are present in a water sample. Pathogens, human pathogens, are disease-causing organisms associated with symptoms like sickness and diarrhoea, depending on the exposure that you have to that water. Okay, so again, we can use standards, this time from the Bathing Waters Directive that Dave talked about earlier, which allow us to group sites into excellent in blue, good in green, or less than good bathing water quality in yellow, with the same health warning that official classification would not split sites into seasonal data. The question about what happens outside of the defined bathing water season, the Big Windermere survey can begin to help us with that because we sample throughout the year on a seasonal basis at least. So generally we see very low levels of bacteria in the vast majority of samples from Windermere shoreline. Again, all of the North Basin and South Basin data for summer, autumn, winter and spring. So the vast majority of our sites in each season are in blue or green, excellent or good bathing water quality with low levels of bacteria. However, we do see in summer and in autumn a smaller number of sites where higher concentrations of these bacteria are present for sure. And that would drop these 
below the standards required for good vaping water quality. Again, how do those bacterial levels for Windermere compare to other lakes and tarns? On the top are E. coli data, on the bottom are Entrococci data, so these two groups of bacteria. The same range of lakes that I mentioned for phosphorus, and again, these are annual data, and the orange or yellow diamond are the average concentrations of these bacteria. So the, the long-term average, long-term meaning four seasons in our data set, are pretty similar across all of our lakes. But actually, you won't be able to see here thanks to the projection, but you can begin to see some of the individual data points for the north and south basin of Windermere. We do see much higher concentrations of bacteria, and those are high enough to drop us below the standards required for good vaping water quality. Okay. Don't think I've lost too many people just yet, and I'm on to my third and final issue for this evening. So I just wanted to say something about the data we collected from August this year. We released those data earlier in November. Some of you may have seen some of the coverage around that. So August was the start of the second year of the Big Windermere Survey. So for the first time, we could look at the same season, summer, between two years, 2022 and 2023. But bear in mind, Summer 22 was June, summer 23 was August. So we were already two months further into the season. Factors such as temperature or rainfall are not going to be the same between the two years. So there, there are some definite caveats in making this interannual comparison. Having destroyed my comparison, I'm then going to make it for you. Okay? So I'm now going to show you that for many sites that we sampled in 22 and 23, the concentrations of bacteria or of phosphorus were actually higher in our 2023 data. So here on the left-hand side is June 22, on the right-hand side is August 23, the same sites in both, both charts. These are bacterial data, and hopefully you can see in August 23 there were a larger number of sites at less than good status, a smaller number at excellent or good status. And we see the same pattern when we looked at the total phosphorus data. So 22 on the left-hand side, 23 on the right-hand side, a much larger proportion of sites at moderate and indeed at poor status than we saw in June 22. So one of the things we're trying to do in the Big Windermere Survey is understand why we see changes in water quality through time. So why did we observe these apparently poorer water quality conditions in the August 23 survey? One of the things we've been looking at is rainfall and runoff around the survey because past research tells us that these are really important factors for water quality. So, for example, here I'm just showing you a photo of a river. Uh, sorry, it's not of the Windermere catchment or the, uh, the Levin catchment. It's of the Eden catchment, just to the east of us. And this is an autumn low flow condition. Hopefully you can see not much water in the stream. Uh, you can see, hopefully, that the colour of the water is relatively clear. And just contrast that with the same location in a summer flood. So the stone arches you can see here in the bridge are pretty much drained out by this increasing flow. And if you can see the colour of the water, it's this chocolate brown, light brown colour. This is sediment that's being mobilised and transported within the system. So what about the rainfall and river discharge conditions during our August Big Windermere survey? So I'm going to show you some rainfall data and some discharge data from the Brave at Jeffy Knott's Wood, basically. And I've got three days down here, the Friday, Saturday, and the Sunday. This was the date of our Big Windermere survey in August. So firstly, the rainfall. It's a little hard to pick out, but the further down the chart these bars come, the larger the amount of rainfall. And hopefully you'll be able to see this quite concentrated period of rainfall here on the Saturday. We had about 30 millimetres of rainfall on that day. That's about 20% of the long-term August, August average rainfall in this one event. So a reasonable rainfall event. What about the river discharge? So here's the discharge curve for the Brady. You can see that it increased quite substantially following this rainfall. So we're up at about almost 20 metres cubed per second. So approximately a 20-fold increase compared to before rainfall. 20 metres cubed per second is about 20 tonnes of water coming down the river every second. 
as I've said, and forgot to click forward, apologies. So the next question is, did we capture that peak discharge with our big Windermere survey data? And the answer to that is, no, we didn't actually. This is the timing of the big Windermere survey sample collection on the Sunday in red, and we missed that peak discharge, okay? This is to refer to somebody's question about how important it is to capture these changes. It's very, very difficult to target short duration events or changes in water quality by mobilizing a citizen science initiative, okay? You would need another approach, like we would need a sonde or a monitor in situ in the river to capture all of that hydrogram. We do, though, still have a, a rise in discharge. So when we did the big Windermere survey in August, we had about seven times the discharge in the Brave Day as we had before rainfall, okay? And when we looked across all five of our big Windermere surveys, August this year was actually the time across the catchment when we saw the highest river discharge associated with this rainfall event. So what we think is going on in these August data is we're seeing the combination of effects. We're seeing the effect of heavy rainfall moving across land surfaces in the catchment, into streams, rivers, and then in through the lake network. And at the same time, we're in the middle of August. So clearly a really important time for the catchment, for the visitor economy, but also a time when visitor numbers are likely to be high in the catchment. And our phosphorus and our bacterial data reflect that combination of pressures. So, congratulations everybody, I've now reached the final slide, just to leave you with some take home messages from me. So firstly, it is very clear from the Big Windermere survey that there is really a significant amount of interest and commitment in the community in understanding Windermere's water quality. And that is the basis to us being able to generate this unique data set through the Big Windermere survey. I don't want to hide away from the fact that the survey data and some of the other data that you will have heard about today do suggest that phosphorus concentrations at certain times in certain locations of Windermere remain higher than we would want to see to protect and restore the lake. But Windermere is not alone in that respect. It is not the unique system that some of the coverage <coughs> has described it as recently. There are opportunities to learn from what we are doing in other systems to help conditions in Windermere. There are, for example, opportunities, some of them are simple, some of them are not simple, as we've heard discussed today, to reduce phosphorus input to the lakes from many sources. Some of them will be associated with assets operated by United Utilities, but many of them will not. They will be to do with private sewage treatment work, septic tanks, land management. The bacterial numbers from the Big Window Survey are generally quite positive, but there are times and there are locations where we see higher concentrations. This is an opportunity to use evidence to identify those sources. There was a question about correlations between nutrients and bacteria. For example, when we look across all of our data, we don't often see strong correlations between nutrients and bacteria. But if you look in specific locations, for example, on Millbeck or Stockgill, then you can see positive correlations between phosphorus and bacteria. One interpretation of that is it suggesting to you a similar source for those pollutants? Finally, I haven't, you'll be pleased to know, got time this evening to go into how these data are being used. We've heard mention of a couple of examples of where Big Windermere survey data is being used either to start or to help continue conversations with others about trying to improve water quality in the catchment. We can talk about Stockgill or Millbeck or Skelleth Bridge or Wilfinbeck or Cumseybeck, all examples of where Big Windermere survey data are already beginning to help contribute to conversations about improving water quality.